Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and the author of The Rejuvenation Blueprint. And today we are discussing different wavelengths of light and their importance and impact. And we're doing this today because Elwin and I were having a conversation about light therapy. And I absolutely know nothing on this subject. So I started to pull some questions. He said, hey, let's do an episode. So I thought, okay, let me get some stuff. And that's why we're I'm going to be asking Elwin so he can help educate me on what light therapy is and also to share his side of everything and its importance in that way. So Elwin, as we begin, um, tell me, is there anything that I should get ready for as I'm about to learn and discover light therapy? Well, yeah, I think when we talked about this episode, we're going to call it a beginner's guide. Um, I'm not an expert in, you know, the advanced levels of this. Uh, I do want to get someone on who is. But actually, I realized listening to some of these advanced guys, they assume a lot of basic information that, like you said, is the case for you, that a lot of our viewers and listeners might not actually have. So I thought, let's do this episode where we talk about all the basics, and then maybe we'll get someone else on to talk about the more advanced levels of stuff. Because yeah, light is super important. It's something I think I had underemphasized and um, generally, you know, most people do even the alternative health community, let alone obviously in the mainstream. And there is a bit of a movement now, as with so many things, I guess, there's, there's a couple of experts who believe and claim loudly and prolifically that light is the most important factor of all for health it's the key as to you know there's all these theories as to why health has gone downhill so badly in the last hundred years especially in the last 40 years in the developed world and there is a theory about that that says that uh, light is perhaps the most important factor not seed oils or you know uh, high fructose corn syrup or pesticides or you know all the other stuff that is maybe accused that actually a dysregulation of light and that sees light as a nutrient so it's funny with light i haven't you know my uh seven areas of focus on the rejuvenate blueprint i haven't been 100 percent sure whether to put light in the building blocks or nutrient kind of category or whether to put it in the lifestyle and i realized it's kind of both in the same way that you know, uh, vitamin C is a nutrient, but like the way you eat might be a lifestyle thing. So it's, it's basically similar. So actually, I would agree with those people based on the research I've done. Light is a nutrient as much as magnesium or, um, you know, any other nutrient in the sense that it is, you know, um, essential for life in the sense that, yes, you can go for a while without it. Like you can with a lot of nutrients and not die. Um, but a lot of stuff does go downhill pretty quickly if you're lacking these nutrients. And yeah, it may be a significant factor in a lot of these chronic health issues. And it's actually not too hard to address. That's one of the other great things. I don't like talking about things like, I don't know, chemtrails or whatever, because even if it's true and even if they're terrible, literally the only way to avoid them currently is to move to like the Southern Hemisphere, which is just not, you know, feasible for most people. Or even talking about the the bad effects of, um, you know, cell phone signals and all the rest of it it's like if you live near a cell phone tower what are you going to do you know it's quite hard to move away from one so i don't love to focus on these things that people have no control over but it turns out actually with light you can make a big difference pretty easily so i'm yeah excited to talk about it wonderful me too i'm looking forward to learning because i have heard about like red light therapy and uh, you know seeing people with these um boards on their wall with the red light bulbs and stuff like that, but I just never understood one, what it's doing, uh, what the benefits are and, um, yeah, where, how it can really address certain, um, what can I say, um, conditions or, or, you know, what are the benefits of it? So beyond red light, or let's, let me ask you this, you know, one, what is light therapy or just specifically red light therapy or are there also other colors that have their own benefits which i'm assuming is a yes but we can get into that throughout as we go forward but um yeah so can you delve in and and give me the the macro and then we can dive dive further in yeah look it's possible that as some in the more alternative community believe every color has its own unique benefits you know like maybe Every color of the rainbow correlates to a chakra and it heals that chakra, all that kind of stuff. That's possible. But if we're sticking within the realm of science, 
Um, then there are a few uh, ranges within that um, spectrum of light that have been proven with numerous, and I mean it, you know, like compared to a lot of nutrients and herbs and stuff like that, there's been a lot of studies done on uh, the impacts of these types of light to validate their importance. And it's just, as I said, not really focused on much until recently. Um, so the types of light that definitely have some benefit that we know for sure are blue light. And that might be one that we start with because um, to understand the benefits of red light, it's actually quite important to understand blue light first. Uh, then there is UV light, um, which we can divide into UVA and UVB. Again, just like with blue light, there's a lot potentially wrong with UV light in certain cases, and it's often maybe got a bad rap. So I'd like to address that because uh, it's certainly not all bad. Um, the next would be uh, far infrared light. So that is a non-visible spectrum of light, except for if you have those infrared goggles uh, that the military uses. Um, uh, but it's basically heat. That's the simple way of looking at that. And even though it's heat, it's it's so close to the light spectrum that you know it's usually categorized as a light type. Um, and then there, lastly, there is red light and near infrared light, which are obviously qualitatively different. Um, I say obvious because with red light you can see it with your eyes, but with uh, near infrared light you can't. Um, or, you know, you not very much anyway, depending often the bulbs that do near infrared, you can see a little bit of something, but uh, I believe that's spill over because it's still spilling over into red light a bit. Um, but anyway, they're often kind of lumped together and I might do that in this episode because the benefits of both are pretty similar. Uh, there are definitely some differences in terms of this, what has been revealed in the study so far, but there's a lot more commonalities than differences. Um, just like UV light is lumped together, but technically UVA and UVB are different and have different functions. And so, uh, yeah, those are the types that, so far at least, we can definitely look as both potential nutrients and also potential toxins, depending on the level and the time and the intensity and all the rest of it. Perfect. Okay. So as you said, let's start with blue light therapy in there. So can you go more into detail about what it's, you know, one, how to access it, what it is, and its benefits and potential, as you said, um, not benefits. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, blue light is the part of the spectrum that's blue. That's pretty simple. Um, it tends to be more in the sunlight during the uh, middle part of the day. Um, so, you know, if you were to actually look at the sun, right, if it's just rising or just setting, you can see it has you know, more of a different color to it. Um, I believe that's an optical illusion, but it still gives you a kind of clue that there's less blue light. Whereas when it's in the sky, it just looks white, right? When it's when it's at its zenith. Um, and so when light looks white to us, that indicates generally that there's a higher portion of blue light that it's actually composed of. So there is nothing wrong with blue light in theory. And in fact, it's essential. But here's the challenge. Uh, here are the challenges about it to you, the average viewer. Um, First of all, it's um, the blue light and especially like the range of frequencies and the intensity of the blue light from the sun because as much as the light from our devices and light bulbs in our rooms and all the rest of it are pretty bright and you, you can feel how bright they are sometimes if you turn them on in the middle of the night, you'll know if it's a bright sunny day and then you turn the light on in your room, like it hardly makes any difference, right? It's not that intense after all. Um, and so that very intense blue light that you tend to only be able to get outside um, really activates our uh, cortisol. It stimulates cortisol in our brain and, and body, but uh, most importantly brain is my understanding. And this sets the circadian clock. So this is the start of, and so it's basically right. So asleep, melatonin is dominant. Um, and then what's supposed to happen if we were in any kind of natural environment, maybe you were sleeping in a cave, right? Our distant ancestors. But anyway, we open our eyes, we go out of the cave and we get this flood of <laughs> intense light in general and intense blue light specifically. Maybe we don't get it straight away if we wake up, you know, at sunset or before sunset or whatever, but 
if that's the case, you know, once that, once the sun starts getting more intense and we start getting a lot of blue light, that's when there's like the signal of this is when the day is really starting from the uh, from the circadian point of view, and so, and it does that by stimulating the production of various stress chemicals um, and also the inhibition of various calming neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, but principally, we just look at that it stimulates cortisol. So it stimulates a lot of cortisol. And we want our cortisol to be high when we first wake up. This is one of the things when we test cortisol, uh, we do a like a, throughout the day test, what we're saying is we want it to be right at the top of the reference range when you first wake up, and then we want it to be near right at the bottom of the reference range, which is way lower, just the reference is way lower when you're sleeping. So we want you to have that spike, and then it's kind of uh, this kind of graph, like it drops, and then it just gradually tapers down over the rest of the day. So we want that spike of cortisol. Um, there, so if you've heard of seasonal affective disorder, which is where people feel worse, um, more sleepy, more depressed, lower energy, lower mood. Those are usually the main symptoms talked about, but of course, uh, lack of energy and lack of mood can create all kinds of secondary, uh, lack of good mood can create all kinds of secondary problems. Yeah, I definitely had that on my list of questions, seasonal dis affective disorder, because obviously here in the UK, that can be quite a big thing or in places where there's not a lot of light, you know, and I and then as we go to it, you know, my other follow part, follow on question to that would be, you know, obviously it, the light is affecting our hormones. And as you just expressed, the blue light's really helping with the cortisol. So I'm assuming that there's a lot more that's going on underneath the surface with the light. Uh, yes. And that kind of gets into how it interacts with other lights. And, uh, you know, I won't go too deep. I'll, as I said, I'll stick practical with this because that's more what I know with this beginner's guide. And we'll get someone in to talk about melanin and POMC and alpha MSH and all these kind of intricacies. Um, but basically, um, so that blue light, you want it to spike when you wake up. It's, it's really important to go and get some real actual outside sunlight. Uh, this is true, even if it's an overcast cloudy day, as it often is in England, um, it's still way more intense than any normal light that you would have in your house. So just turning on all the you know, fluorescent or LED lights or whatever in your room is not the same. Um, if you don't believe me on that, and I remember I didn't really believe this, so I did this test myself, you can buy a device that measures lumens. So lumen is like a uh, unit of light. And I, I believe it's reasonably accurate as well. You can just get an app for your phone, which also measures the level of lumens. And so try that, compare that to with all the lights on in your um, room versus going outside even on a cloudy, overcast, gloomy day. And you'll see still, even on a cloudy, overcast, gloomy day, there's way more lumens coming from outside than there is inside with all your lights on. Um, unless, as I said, you have special lighting, which we can talk about. Um, so, oh yeah, and just to finish on seasonal effect disorder, then I'll go into the bad side of it. Um, so one of the treatments that's actually pretty effective for seasonal affective disorder is actually with blue light. So it's not with red light. Despite all the benefits of red light that we're going to talk about, um, with seasonal affective disorder, you can get a very bright blue light. Um, you can get them on, you know, eBay, Amazon, all the rest of it, all the companies that specialize in this. And I think for about 50 to hundred dollars, something like that, you can get something that is intense enough. It has to be producing a certain amount of lumens for it to actually be effective. And then the idea is that you hold this very bright light pretty close to your face. You don't look into it directly. Um, so you can do whatever, you know, look at your phone or whatever people normally do when they first wake up that maybe they shouldn't, but oil meditation or yoga or whatever you're doing that you should be doing. <laughs> but whatever you're doing, you kind of, the idea is, let's say if it's meditation, you're sitting there, um, it has to be eye open meditation, I guess, but you'd be sitting there, not looking directly at the light, but you have the light from this bright light going into your eyes, even though not looking at it directly. Um, for about 10 minutes, I believe is the minimum, 20, 30 might be better. And this then sets the circadian rhythm. It will give you a feeling of increased energy. It will help with mood uh, because energy and mood are very closely related. And it will potentially help you also to be able to get to sleep later, as long as you do some of the other stuff we're gonna talk about like in a timely manner. Um, so yeah, that's one of the primary treatments for seasonal affective disorder 
is actually to get that intense blue light. And and I say the thing about the, the buying the blue light from eBay or whatever, because let's say you live on the 50th floor of a you know the inner city and even when you do walk outside the buildings are so tall there's you know hardly any light and the smog and all the rest of it and noise and violent criminals you know maybe there's an argument to be to not go outside we're not all in the same environment so obviously if you can go outside that's better um, but if it really is not feasible to go outside straight away when you wake up then um and also even if you can go outside but if it is that darkest part of the year and you do tend to suffer from seasonal affective disorder then that artificial light has been shown in uh, a lot of research to be pretty effective as well, well enough that it's recommended by a lot of authorities. For just before we move on, uh, within seasonal affective disorder, with that lack of blue light, because I know we were talking about, you mentioned that it triggers the cortisol first thing in the morning. Is it then that lack of cortisol that's causing that mood shift or is it something else? And and I don't want to like go down on a tangent here, but just in case you might have a quick, quick answer there. Yeah, it, it's a few different things. The ones that I'm aware of that are obvious is, yeah, number one, the cortisol. So cortisol, it's a stress hormone, uh, but it is also an energy hormone. It's also an anti-inflammatory hormone. Uh, we do not want it to be chronically high because that indicates that something is going on that's very bad and cortisol in and of itself is toxic if it stays high. But the, the idea is to have that brief spike. Now, I said that you know blue light will spike that cortisol first thing in the morning, but that's an ideal situation. The reality is that that blue light will spike the cortisol full stop and that's right. the problem and that's what you know we're about to get into. But yeah, to answer the question about SAD, uh, you know, another thing, um, I believe is that it will clear away some of that melatonin. So if you've ever taken melatonin, like a large dose of it to get to sleep, and then you, if you woke up the next morning still feeling groggy, sometimes your mood does feel a bit lower. Um, sometimes it feels a lot lower. Um, and certainly, you know, lack of mental clarity, lack of energy. So that's like where you've artificially over melatonin yourself. Um, but, you know, the, the light equivalent of that is if you haven't had enough blue light, that will, blue light basically dissipates that kind of shroud or fog of melatonin, which helps to keep you in a, you know, dreaming, sleeping state to some degree. Um, but those are simple answers. There is definitely more to it. As, as I said, that we'll get, a, you know, an expert on to explain all the detailed biochemistry of it. Perfect. And then if we have too much blue light, what does that, how does that impact us? Yeah, so the reason that these people are making these assertions that light is the most important nutrient and it is the key to the chronic health epidemic and all the rest of it, the reason that they can say that, one of the primary reasons, probably the primary one, arguably, is because of the amount and also percentage of artificial blue light that we're exposed to. So, like I said, that, that intense blue light is supposed to be... Um, you know, uh, in our eyes from, you know, mid-morning to depending on what time zone, uh, depending on um, where we are in the season or whatever, like, you know, evening, mid-afternoon kind of level, and then it's supposed to taper down. So one of the big problems and that blue light, even with the midday sun, it comes with UV light of both types, in, uh, red light, near infrared light, far infra infrared light, the other uh, spectrums of light like green um, as well. That's really the primary uh, one. Um, that is absent in most of the artificial lighting that we have. And more so than before. This is where people get a bit conspiratorial. So the old incandescent light bulbs that we had until relatively recently um, had a reasonable um, spectrum of different light. It certainly didn't have a lot of like, well, it didn't have any near infrared or UV, but it at least had like the range from, you know, uh, red to blue, a reasonable amount of all of them to some degree. Um, this is why I don't know if you remember like when I was young, there was always this complaint Chrissy, about uh, fluorescent light, how it's unnatural and mm -hmm. unpleasant and all the rest of it. And so there was like this unpleasant fluorescent life like you might have in offices and hospitals. And, and then there was the okay light that you had in your own home. Well, recently that's changed and the vast majority of people 
you know, they, they claim it was to, uh, for ecology or to save energy or whatever. Like, I believe, depending on your country, you can't even get those incandescent lights. They're illegal now. Um, so all you can get is these LED lights. And these LED lights, unless you get the right kind, and I will talk about this because I upgraded my whole house. <laughs> this is lights <laughs> a few months ago, and I'm happy to share about what I did. Um, but unless you're really on top of this, um, your all your lights now are going to be pretty much 100% blue light. And so that means that, and then all your devices, again, unless you're on top of it, that most people are staring at most of the time, are going to be um, a heavy like uh, over representation of blue light out of the different light spectrums coming into your eyes. And obviously people often have their phones like that close to them or whatever. So it's this intense blue light and then blue light and everywhere around you. And that cortisol's coming at you. It's, it's, yeah, exactly so. If you have trouble falling asleep late at night because you've got a whole bunch of screen time, you might now know why. Yes, yeah, it's it definitely a significant factor, but it goes way beyond that. So it, yes, but also... Uh, what if your metabolism is dysregulated? What if you, you know, are depressed? What if you um, can't lose weight? What if your body can't process toxins? Like all this other stuff. Um, what if, you, you know, it could even lead to a depletion of nutrients, for instance, because when your body's in a high cortisol state, it's more likely to burn through certain nutrients more quickly. Or like, for instance, it makes you excrete potassium and use up magnesium more quickly. And, you know, deficiencies of those are far more common these days. So you can really go down the rabbit hole as to all of the myriad effects that, that ex chronic exposure to blue light, um, again, although it's not that intense, as I just made the point of five minutes ago, um, it's the ratio of the fact that it is mainly blue light with none of the other mitigating or balancing effects of the other frequencies of light uh, that you would get in the real natural world. Um, that is really the issue. It's uh, it's the percentage of blue light. So yeah, and what you said though is hundred percent right, Chrissy. That's the most obvious effect is not being able to get to sleep, um, and it's it because it's it's one of those things that's background. You know, I try and point these things out that are background. You know, like I've talked before about air purity. No one really thinks about it unless they can smell something, but it makes a huge difference. Or no one thinks about what they put on the skin, but it makes a huge difference. Well. Most people don't think about what's going into their eyes, but it makes a huge difference. So this is another example of that. And again, it's not that blue light is bad. It, that's why I started with giving a case study where it's actually healing people, but it's just that it's the ratio of the blue light to all the other lights that we're about to talk about. Um, and so do you want to talk about what we do about that or do you want to talk about the other types of light? I'm not quite sure. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, is it specific? Because th then I'd ask you, is what we do about it specific for each color of light or each, you know, spectrum? Or is it more a general? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's specific to blue light. Yeah, we'll, we'll okay, talk yeah, about it Yeah, let's talk now. about it now then, yeah. So there's a couple of things we can do about this. Um, so really, at night or after the sun has gone down, or really, even, let's say if you're a night shift worker and you have to maintain a different situation, just a few hours before you plan to go to sleep, you really want to remove all the um, blue light or as much of the blue light as possible. If you think about our ancestors up until, you know, whatever it is, 120 years ago, um, they also had light at night. They were not, you know, uh, savages, but they would have had firelight, candlelight, torchlight, um that's that's pretty much it right and and moonlight and all of those types of light would uh especially the first three i just said there would be heavily focused on the red end of the spectrum especially fire any light that comes from fire so obviously that's like a fireplace candles um that kind kind of light is predominantly uh fire infrared light so it's heat it's literally producing heat obviously that's the primary reason people have a fireplace um, but also red light and near infrared light. And so that's the kind of light that is beneficial um, at the end of the day. It's beneficial in general. We'll talk about that in the next section. But in terms of the blue light, so what you want to do is shift the ratio from high percentage of blue light uh, earlier in the day to as little percentage of blue light as possible while still being able to see. So in a practical sense, there's a couple of ways you can achieve that. Uh, first of all, a lot of people do this. You and I know a couple of people who did this, Chrissy. 
Um, they just wear these blue light blocking glasses all the time. So usually they look basically red. It's like wearing red glasses. Um, I don't like wearing glasses because my ears are a little bit lopsided. So they always, I used to have to wear glasses <laughs> and it was, it's like they're always falling off. They're always at an angle. They're never great. But if you like wearing glasses, uh, that is a fantastic way of doing it. The only thing I would say is some people wear those glasses like they're quite thin lenses like that. Like the type that are really effective is maybe the most cool looking, but the ones that really wrap around. Because if you still get a load of blue light coming in from all the sides and the edges of the um, uh, glasses, then it's definitely still got some benefits because obviously where you're focused is where a lot of light comes in. And if that's being filtered to only allow in the red spectrum, that will still certainly do something. Um, but my, you know, I would say if you really want those to be highly effective, then you have to get the ones that really don't allow much blue light in from all the sides as well. The kind of ones that are almost like goggles basically. And those are available and they're cheap. I think you can get a perfectly decent pair that is effective at least, maybe not the trendiest or whatever, but you know, $20, something like that. So that's a very affordable way of addressing that particular situation. Um, that I would recommend for anyone on a budget. That's a great way of doing it. Now, if you're not on a budget, if you're worried about what you look like, if everyone makes fun of you for wearing these big red goggles at night, um, then you know there is other options. So in terms of the screens, for most of what you're looking at, um, you know whether it's a, it's a bit more difficult with TVs, though it's still possible, but certainly most people are looking at phones and iPads and laptops and stuff these days, right? More than TVs. Uh, probably kind of person who watches this anyway. Um, and so with those, it's very possible to um, turn on red light. There used to be like an app that did it that I used to use, but these days the devices often do it themselves. So literally whatever the name of your device is, you can just Google how to make it red light and you should see something comes up. And then you can really control as well how much you want it to be red light. And there are other settings, like often you can have it so that as soon as it gets dark outside, it like automatically shifts into the red light mode. And as soon as it's light outside, it automatically shifts out. Or you can kind of set what time you want that to happen if you are not quite in alignment with the circadian clock like I'm not. Um, so yeah, there's all that can be done. So for the devices, it's pretty easy these days. Now for the house, it's also pretty easy. It just costs a bit more. Um, so I ended up uh, getting these things called bio lights. Um, I think there's, there's several companies that do it. I'll, if you remind me, I'll send you a link afterwards, yeah, Chrissy, of, yeah, of a couple. Um, so there are some that will produce 100% red light. Now, I have that in my bedroom. Um, I don't feel any need for any other spectrum of light in my bedroom. So I'm happy with that there. However, throughout most of the house, you can imagine what my wife thought if I just had like 100% red light throughout the house. She's like, I can't see anything, you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Elwin, why are you always making our lives more difficult? So I was like, hmm, okay, how am I going to address this? And so I found that actually there are these lights available these days um, that will go, that will shift between the spectrums. So there are three phases. Um, one of them is like high blue, but basically normal full spectrum but a decent amount of blue, but still full spectrum, so better than most other LED lights. But basically, it looks bright. Then the second one is like an evening light that has a higher degree of red um, and much less blue. And then there's like a nighttime setting that is red um, and green still, but no blue. So that's so red and green will still look kind of orange, so it's still not as obviously just like a red light, as pure red light like I have in the bedroom. So throughout most of the house, I have those now. They have all kinds. They have the ceiling light version. They have the bayonet ones. They have the screw cap. So pretty much whatever type of bulbs you have, those are available. Uh, they're not super cheap. Um, so, you know, there is that to consider, obviously, but it's it's a question, again, of what you want to spend on your health. And as I said, there is, the cheaper version is just wearing the goggles. Um, that works just as well. I just don't like wearing goggles. Um, so, I, so I got those in the house, and they're great, you know. So basically, every time you switch it on and off, it goes between modes. Somehow, through some electrician magic, they all sync with each other. Like in the kitchen, we've got like a dozen of these, uh, whatever they're called, ceiling lights that go down. And uh, they all sync with each other and it's just, you know, off and on, off and on. And that will uh, cycle through the different modes. So as I said, even 
if you don't avail yourself of the evening mode at all, it's still good to get that full spectrum type of LED for the reasons we talked about, as opposed to the common type of LED that's like a very high percentage of blue light. Well, absolutely. I mean, we are spending so much of our lives inside now that we're rarely, you know, thank God I have dogs because I have to go outside and I have to walk them because otherwise I'd just be at my desk. You know, now my uh, my job is, at, you know, sitting at the desk a lot. So yeah, otherwise I wouldn't really have to go outside. So this is a really good option. Yeah, definitely for someone in that position. And I try and go outside, as you know, Chrissy, I'm always like, if I'm not literally filming or making notes, I'm usually, uh, when I'm on calls, which is a lot of the day, I'm always walking around and if it's not raining, I'm walking around outside, you know, during the day, especially for that reason to be getting sunlight. So I just say that to give people another example. You don't have to be in front of your desk typing, but you have to be on like a desk job kind of thing. But if, you know, if you're in an office and you're able to leave without someone complaining and walk outside, or if you're at home, if you're working from home and you're able to walk outside, then uh, I do recommend it because all the stuff I'm saying, all the artificial stuff I'm talking about, and I do recommend it and use it, but um, just getting actual sunlight, if you can, is still better. But I realize it's not possible for everyone, like you said. You know, I know most of your job requires you to sit and take notes, Chrissy. So then, yeah, you have to be in front of a you know, computer. It's just the way it is. Um, so, yeah, so that's uh, – so on blue light, those are the different options of mitigating. We haven't really talked about why it's – red is so beneficial, but all I've said so far is it's just – preferable to blue at night or after the sun sets that's the thing to clarify and blue light is very toxic after the sun has set it's basically toxic to have blue light for too much of the day right so it's a purely case... because it's it's peaking that cortisol correct yeah because what we want with cortisol i mean on a simplistic level yes uh what we want that cortisol is the spike in the day and we want it to kind of drop pretty quickly and then just kind of slowly taper off until the rest of the day if we are indoors all day then in terms of the impact the light has on us at least, what we have is like it's just mid medium of the graph all day. It's never high, but never sets the circadian clock and energizes us when we first wake up. So that's why people need coffee and all these other things to try and give them energy. But then it never drops enough that we actually feel relaxed and uh, you know we can enjoy ourselves and be in the present moment and ultimately fall asleep easily either. So we get like the worst of both worlds. So that blue light we want to start intense you know, mid and then after a certain period of time, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, something like that, we wanted to really taper off to being very little. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your genetic insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. 
Beautiful. So that's a great segue into red light therapy. So talk to us about that. Why is it so beneficial? Okay. Well, let's talk about the uh, different types, right? So there's what's called far infrared. It's basically heat. Um, <laughs> again, someone might say I'm oversimplifying it, but from an experiential point of view, uh, that's exactly what it is. So what does heat do? Um, we probably know that in terms of uh, you know what it does to our cells, it, 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 it makes molecules kind of move and vibrate more quickly, right? This is what uh, microwave technology uh, kind of worked out a cheat code for is they, you know, it just kind of stimulates the uh, molecules to move without far infrared. And so it's like an artificial way of heating something up. But like other than those kind of cheats, basically the way that you heat something up is with infrared because of its tendency to uh, stimulate the increase of the vibration, the movement of, you know, every cell. Um, and by doing that, it, you know, Great. It causes a lot of other stuff to happen, but you know we'll get into that. Let me talk about each type first. Um, and so then there is red light. So that's the type you can actually see, right? You go into a room and it has a light and it's just red. <laughs> then that's red light. <laughs> Congratulations, you know. Um, and then there's near infrared, and that is the one that um, I think there's a lot of more excitement about these days. Um, there are you know people use near infrared light therapy like bulbs have been used for quite a long time for you know athletes and acupuncturists use it and physios and different things because of its various different uh, supporting of healing and reducing pain and stuff like that so you might be familiar with that from those kind of use cases um, often that will be combined with far infrared as well it'll be like a heating lamp but it, it will have that near infrared spectrum as well um, uh, and then, yeah, so, and then there is the near infrared. So near and far, all it means is you have the rainbow, uh, violet on one end, red on the other end. So near just means it's the type that's outside the visible spectrum, but is near the visible spectrum. And then far means it's outside the visible spectrum a lot. <laughs> that's really <laughs> all that it means, right? That's <laughs> so simple. That's why we call it near and far. It's just referring to how close it is to the visible um, light spectrum. And so, like I say, even though near and far infrared are both types of infrared, and we might think of them as being more in one category together and then red in another category, because there's the red I can see, the red I can't, that's the kind of easy way to conceptualize it. But actually, in terms of the impact it has, and so far what all the research has shown, um, there's a lot more in common between the red light and the near infrared light than there is between either and the far infrared light. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah, it does. I'm understanding it. Yeah, I get it. I think okay. so. <laughs> uh, so basically, yeah. all right, so it's red and then near. Yes, and then far, for the visible and far. And I'm yeah. saying near and red, similar, Yeah. far, different. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. There's makes some sense. commonalities. Um, and so I say that because often, you know, in a practical sense, um, if you go and you know buy these devices, often they will have both. And in fact, they should have both. If you would like to experience the benefits of red light, you should probably make sure the device also has near infrared light and vice versa, right? Again, they come together. Whereas far infrared light is often a different thing. It's like a sauna. Now some devices do do both, um, but yeah. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense because I got a sauna, a, a, a solo sauna just itself, and it was that far infrared. And I was like, okay, well, wait, there's no light, but it's just, it's the heat. So you've completely, yeah, and I had never quite understood that fully until now. So that's really great. <laughs> great. Um, and then the near infrared also produces some heat, just to confuse things a little bit more. Um, but that's not like the main impact that it has because, again, it's nearer to the visible light spectrum. So it has less of a heat, heat impact and more of a light. Fact. <laughs> that makes sense. So anyway, um, what does the red stroke near infrared light do? It does a lot. Um, in fact, I didn't remember it also. I have a couple of notes here in front of me. I'll probably read from to um, stimulate my memory. Uh, but the most fundamental thing that it does, I said the most fundamental thing, the fire infrared does it kind of um, uh, speeds up the vibration of the cells. Um, the most impactful thing that the both the other types of red light do is they... Um, speed up the activity of the mitochondria within the cell. That's the crucial thing about them. Um, now, we've talked about mitochondria and energy a lot, including recently. 
Um, we've talked about it a lot in the context of metabolism. We've talked about the thyroid a lot. So just to very briefly recap that, the thyroid is um, the primary signal that the body uses within itself to tell the mitochondria to produce more or less energy. And so it does that like the gas or accelerator pedal is increasing the level of T3 and then the brake is reducing the level of T3. So that's how the body regulates itself, the level of mitochondrial and the rate of mitochondrial energy production, ATP production, which is energy. But there is something exogenous, so primarily outside yourself, that also has a significant signaling effect as to the rate that those mitochondria are acting. And that is this light, the red light and near infrared light. They have a big impact as well on that signaling. And so that's why I'd say, for instance, for someone who is really struggling to raise their metabolism uh, and someone for whom even thyroid isn't working, and those people definitely do exist, it does happen, or it's not helping enough, it's not helping them get to a full you know, 37 or 98.6. Red light may be the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, that may be the thing that is also required. Or, you know, how do I say it? Like an excess blue light. So we talked earlier about, you know, what else, what is bad about blue light? Well, that's one of the other things. So we've talked about this a lot, that um, generally we are either in a relaxed ventral vagal, relaxed but energized state where we're, you know, we are alert and yet at the same time we're not vigilant, like we feel safe and happy and secure and social and yet we feel awake, basically. Um, so that's kind of a, like an optimal state to be in and that correlates with an optimal amount of mitochondrial activity and ATP production. Right? I know I'm skipping over this a bit, but it's because we have talked about it quite a few times before. Um, and so, and then there's another mode that we can get into where there is not enough mitochondrial energy, there's not enough ATP production, there's not a fast enough metabolism, and then the body is more in a stress state um, where it's in a fight or flight sympathetic state. And depending on the person's genetic and circumstance and all the rest, if that goes on long enough, they may be in a dorsal vagal state, which is like a, a hibernation state or a shutdown state. But the stress state is, you know, more common. And so, again, if you've watched a lot of my episodes or listened to, you've almost certainly heard me talk about this before. That's why I'm just breezing over it. But here's a connection to light. So if there is a lot of blue light, and especially if there's also not a lot of red light, then you have a lot of stimulation of that sympathetic st state and not enough stimulation of that relaxed but energized optimal metabolism state. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that is why, in my opinion, that's the, the primary reason why there are a lot of studies showing the benefits of red light are things that you wouldn't think, like, for instance, weight loss uh, or reduction of cellulite, stuff like that. You're like... How does shining, it almost sounds too good to be true. It sounds like a lie again, right? Like, how does shining light on me make me lose weight? Well, I don't have to eat less. I don't have to exercise, you know. Ugh. But it, it basically has a similar mechanism to thyroid. Um, as we talked about before, if someone's thyroid activity is high enough, it is impossible to be overweight. And ditto, and that. why is that? It's not because my, thyroid is a magic fat dissolver. It's because the thyroid will increase the metabolism. Well, Red light will increase the metabolism to the degree, you know, up until the point that the other factors stopping it, at least, you know, but it will tend to stimulate metabolism. And I believe, and, you know, I have this list in front of me, we'll get to it in a second, but just to explain before we get to the list, and there are numerous benefits, and we'll talk about some of the primary ones, but to me, the fundamental most primary benefit of red light, the reason it's super important whether it's getting sun in the middle of the day, because that still has plenty of red light as well, whether it's, uh, you know, being at firelight and candlelight and stuff like that in the evening or at nighttime. Um, and yes, whether it's using modern day things like, you know, red light panels, red light saunas, red light devices, people have like face masks of red light, baseball caps with red light, you know, all kinds of specific localized things. What's like the reason why it can have a myriad of benefits and there are research showing that it has a myriad of benefits. Um, to me, the 
the originator of it is that it stimulates the increased um, production of ATP. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So w within that context, just to recap of what you really just were saying, is that that red light that, as you talked about, that's, it's going to be... Um, yeah, stimulating, activating the mitochondrial cells, which is then going to, you know, get that metabolism going, going to get things go, uh, sped, well, not sped, sped up necessarily, but working and working more efficiently. And so that's why it's having those effects with the things that, um, uh, supporting those conditions where the metabolism might be slow, like you were saying with weight loss and things like that. And that's why it's supporting those types of conditions people are potentially having issues with. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And sped up is correct. I mean, the rate of energy production is sped up by red light. As I said, up until the point that there is something blocking it from happening. Maybe there's not enough nutrients, there's not enough thyroid, there's not enough some other, you know, thing that's necessary, there's not enough CO2 or oxygen or whatever. But up until the point that it runs out, or <laughs> it will speed up that, um, that uh, energy production. Now, it's, to me, that's the primary benefit because I, you know, as I'm happy to see more and more in the mainstream-ish world are saying, you know, metabolism, mitochondrial health is super primary and important. Um, but there are other bunch of other benefits, you know, related to it as well. Um, so, uh, it's, so in terms of the mechanism of how it happens, it's this, um, uh, uh, gene enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. So that's the thing, uh, the receptor within the mitochondria that actually recognizes the red light and sees that as a trigger, um, to, you know, speed up that production of ATP. So in the same way that, it has a receptor for the T3, the thyroid hormone. It has a receptor for that uh, red light. Um, so it obviously increases uh, ATP, as we've talked about. Uh, increases something called cyclic AMP, um, which is an anti-inflammatory uh, enzyme. Um, it increases the level of uh, calcium in the cell. Um, increases nitric oxide. Um, this is a mixed bag. This is one of the reasons we don't want to overdo it with red light, especially when we're using artificial red light, because there is such a thing as too much nitric oxide. Um, but nitric oxide can be beneficial for all the reasons that are commonly talked about, specifically, primarily, you know, vasodilation. A lot of people are suffering from a lack of blood flow in and out of um, uh, areas of their body. You know, obviously, cardiovascular health being one of the primary killers for um, most uh, countries. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, there's loads of other genes that I won't bother listing. Um, but let's go into some of the, you know, more, I'd say, bigger mechanisms. Um, so it definitely reduces inflammation. And so, um, so uh, cortisol also reduces inflammation, interestingly. So both blue light and red light have this uh, potentially anti-inflammatory effect. But the thing is, cortisol only... Uh, reduces inflammation um, in this kind of more short-term way. So if you have... Kind of like an emergency response. Yeah, exactly. So you, if you have cortisol chronically but not that high, so moderately high throughout all of your waking time and probably even sleeping time as well, um, that is going to create more and more of an inflammatory state. Absolutely. Um, and the same is not true for red light. So you can actually have red to light exposure pretty much 24 seven, I believe is what the research says, as long as it is not excessive, um, it will still have that anti-inflammatory effect. So that is the difference between the blue light and the red light, is the red light is consistently um, anti-inflammatory. Um, and it does so, you know, via similar um, uh, mechanisms as just anti-inflammatory uh, medicines, like uh, aspirin or, um, or uh, Tylenol, I think you guys call it, paracetamol or whatever, you know, working on prostaglandin, COX-1 and 2, and NFKB, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it also stimulates the immune system, right? So it stimulates more uh, white blood cell production. Um, so it's said anti-inflammatory. So as we talked about, the immune system is vastly complicated, but on a very simple level, there are a bunch of constituents of the immune system that are more uh, attacking, organisms and there are a bunch of constituents that are more regulating making sure that that's not excessive and making sure that the attacking is done in an intelligent way um, 
And so it will increase the ratio of um, regulatory components to the immune system, but it will also just increase the activity of the immune system in general. So if you have infections, if you have you know, chronic infections, for instance, which a lot of people with low metabolism do suffer with, um, then it can be helpful on, on that level as well. My understanding is far infrared light is more helpful for that. Um, Why would that be? Uh, it's more effective at increasing the core temperature more. Um, so with the near and red light, it's more just kind of optimizing it to be close to what you want it to be. Um, with far infrared, um, obviously it's like stimulating the um, production of heat. Well, it is heat, but it's, what's the word? Increasing the heat of your own cells. Um, that definitely increases the activity of the immune system. But the difference with that is you can't do it all day, every day, right? So... No, and should there be a time limit? And should there be a time limit? Like if you are in a infra far infrared sauna, because obviously it is producing heat, you are sweating. Like, is there a point where you go beyond the benefit? Yeah, definitely. Um, you, can, you can be too hot for too long. That's why doctors are always concerned about a fever, right? So any deviation from the optimal, which my understanding is still that's, you know, 37 or 98.6, um, can be utterly justified and uh the, the right thing for your body to do within a certain circumstance but if it is too long it becomes problematic as we talked about it's crazy to me that if you f should be 37 and if you're 35.5 your doctor is not bothered sorry if you're yeah 35.5 yeah. your doctor is not bothered but if you not are as equally concerned yeah exactly really they're probably not concerned at all um but if you are 38.5 then they're like, oh, you got a fever. Let's let's investigate. Let's see if uh, you got an infection or whatever, right? Uh, because a fever in itself is damaging. Yeah, it's overstimulating um, the cells. It's overstimulating that, um, which you know, it's increasing level of reactive ox oxygen species, for instance. Um, so yeah, it's going to have a damaging effect um, if it is too long. The heat shock proteins, which you know, generally considered to be beneficial, again, they're only beneficial for so long. Now. Some people do push this. Um, they will do you know saunas for three or four hours a day. I've known people who do protocols like that. Um, other than maybe the medium to long term damage of you know being too too hot, um, there is also just the short term damage of. And let's say it's at a level where it's not dangerous, but it's still you know not great. Like maybe say thirty eight. Um, there's the the obvious thing that you've already mentioned. Your body will sweat and attempt to cool you down. And if it sweats too much, you're going to lose too many electrolytes and that's um, going to you know, potentially uh, severely imbalance you. So that's definitely another potential downside of that far uh, infrared light, which you're just not going to get even with heavy exposure to red light or near infrared light. It's not going to overheat you to the degree that you lose too many electrolytes. It's going to create different problems if you overdo it, <laughs> which we'll talk about. Um, but it won't cause that problem because it's less, it's more optimizing the metabolism, but it's 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 kind of increasing your body's own um, capacity to increase energy. It's got like the difference between it's the near infrared is like, um, as I said, like via that cytochrome C oxidase enzyme, um, giving the signal to your mitochondria to produce its own energy and therefore heat. Whereas the, the far infrared, it's more just um, heating up from the outside rather than from the inside, as it were. So that's why it can be too excessive far more easily and potentially dangerous far more easily. Um, so, you know, back to the uh, other things. So um, it's uh, near infrared has been shown to uh, protect cells from various toxins, which is very interesting, heavy metals, cyanide, uh, different alcohols, benzene, methanol, all that kind of thing. So it uh, seems to have a cell protective effect. Is that just simply again, because it's producing ATP? I would say maybe yes, but the research on that isn't clear. Um, it also will increase the rate of the uh, turnover of cells. So why could that be a beneficial thing? Well, for instance, one of the things that it's used for is uh, this type of red light is for the skin, right? So people apply it to the skin, their skin after a while, and usually it actually doesn't take very long. It starts to look younger, it starts to look clearer and all the rest of it. Now, is that potentially a problem if you overdo it? I would say yes, 
You know, we've talked about this in the episode of um, the mechanism by which retinol works. It's basically like a, a chemical peel that's burning the layers of your skin and that forces the stem cells to create new skin layers, which will, yes, look younger and cleaner and fresher and all the rest of it. But if you carry on doing it too much, it'll deplete your stem cells. Um, I My understanding is that is the same thing with the red light, uh, but not as much because whereas with the retinol, it's just kind of creating damage which your stem cells then have to scramble to uh, repair and by doing so make you look better. But at least with this, it is increasing the capacity of your own body to create more of those cells, including stem cells. So it's still, it's definitely better than a chemical peel or whatever, but it's still, there could be a point again where you are overstimulating and your body cannot keep up with it, maybe because it runs out of nutrients um, in order to, keep up with that increased rate of cell production. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Because I do see a lot of beauty treatments out there with these um, red light therapy masks that you can, you know, buy for medic and, I guess, enhancement or support. Um, yeah, so is there anything specific that people should be looking at when purchasing something like that? Um, yeah, let's get into the practical afterwards, uh, okay. if that's okay. Let me give yeah, you yeah, a couple yeah, yeah. more um, just mechanisms. So it's interesting how important is for the brain as well, this uh, type of red light. Um, not so much through the signal of going through your eyes necessarily and giving a signal, although I believe that's there, um, but literally more for similar reasons that we talked about because it creates movement of things. So we talked about like increased flow of um, creating ATP and we've talked about increased rate of producing you know, cells. Um, so there's also this thing called the glymphatic system um, which you know uh, connects the brain with the rest of the body. And so basically your brain, it turns out, has its own kind of toxin dumping and removing and recycling kind of system that is not necessarily going to be working very well. You kind of have to stimulate it to make sure that it's doing that. And uh, this happens especially at night, this is my understanding, which is one of the many reasons why it's so important to sleep well and to sleep enough. Um, but the uh, the near and red light therapy are very effective as well at creating that movement of the glymphatic system and helping to detoxify the brain. That's why the substantial studies, for instance, that uh, not even that much red light therapy can make a difference with Alzheimer's. It can make a difference with depression. It can make a difference with anxiety. It can make a decision with uh, ADD, all these kind of brain related things. A surprising amount, I think I just saw a study of, what was it, either 8 or 16 minutes of exposure to red light on the head, uh, I think in either one or two sessions, I'm sorry, it's definitely one or two of what, of what I'm saying, um, showed a reduction of depression even four weeks later, just those one wow. or two treatments, like a significant reduction in depression. Um, and just showing that a lot of Mental health issues are fundamentally physical. That's you know, always been my understanding. It's not only, as I've also said, it's it's both. It's it's kind of how you use your brain as well, but it is definitely related to what's in there. And if you've got a bunch of toxins, if you've got a bunch of you know heavy metals or mycotoxins or PCBs or microplastics or whatever it might be um, getting in the way and stopping those things working correctly, then helping the process of flushing them out can make a huge difference, can absolutely help you feel better, can even cure or maybe not cure, but significantly reduce the symptoms of diseases that are thought to be incurable. Um, so yeah, that's another powerful benefit. One of the things it's commonly used for is, uh, you know, injuries, same kind of mechanism I just said for the skin is also true for collagen synthesis, you know, everywhere. So for the mus uh, for the muscles, um, and for the tendons and for the ligaments and for the joints, uh, all of that kind of thing. And even bones. It's even been shown that um, with uh, DEXA scans that uh, this one obviously takes a little longer, but um, that over time with red light therapy, especially if it's done in the way that it will penetrate the bones, because that's not guaranteed. Again, we can talk about that. Uh, but if it is done in that way, that the um, the bones can become thicker and stronger. And again, you'd think for that to be to happen, you'd need, you know, maybe resistance training or something, right, to put enough strain on the bones, or you'd think you need, I don't know, calcium and vitamin K2 and all the rest of it to build the bones, but 
again, interestingly, just having enough exposure to that frequency of light will do it, which again is why I like to, you know, I'm giving a lot of examples here, but it's why I like to see this as a nutrient, I hope you can see. Um, hair regrowth even. Um, so it's That's funny. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so this is something that I tried. So like uh, my wife is like worried about getting Alzheimer's because it's in her family and I'm like, and I'm bored. So I was like, you know what? Between the two of us, I bought one of these caps like a baseball cap that has both red light and near infrared light in it. Um, and so you wear it. And so it's very, very close, right? I mean, it's pretty much touching your uh, head. And and this this is the type of device that was used, by the way, for the study I just said with the um, depression um, getting substantially better with just one treatment. Um, there's a downside that I found for me, and but also my wife, which is um, as soon as we use it, if we use anything close to eight minutes, um honestly even just a minute or two it starts to make both of us feel kind of ill like uh really why do you think that is uh i think it's getting the glymphatic system moving i think both of our ah, brains are so obviously that detox. it's flushing both of our brains are pretty toxic when i say kind of ill it's not full-blown but it's like you know your nose starts getting blocked uh you're starting to feel a little bit less energy a little bit less you know mentally clear all the rest of it um so my strategy of it now is to do just like super low level of exposure so even though the studies may say that you know five minutes produces this miracle or whatever i'm like yeah but it also makes me feel ill so i'm just doing like 20 Small seconds increments yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Bu <laughs> building up allowing your supporting your body to where it can meet you without having to feel awful yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense okay i mean i might have to get that link from you <laughs> and that's uh you know one example i kind of skipped there but um yeah in fact you know close to the end of my list i mean there is loads more benefits but i think that's like a, a good starting place um so yeah there are potential downsides right i just gave it an example there now to be fair um as i said with that particular delivery mechanism the red light is literally like less than an inch away from your skull uh it's doing that on purpose because the skull is pretty thick and it's trying to penetrate into the brain so that's purposeful you wouldn't normally have it so close to you uh, but i think it's be basically the the closer the red light is to you this is actually true for a fireplace as much as it is for uh these devices the more of an intense effect it's going to have on you now any natural source of near infrared and red light has an automatic safety valve to make sure that you don't overdo it. Can you guess what it is? The heat or heat. The feeling? The, yeah. Exactly, right? Because they always go together in real life, in nature. So in nature, you get too close to the fire, you will feel hot before you will overstimulate your um, cells, your mitochondria with near infrared and red light. So because of the wonders of technology, we've created this technology that kind of only has the red light and the near infrared light without the fire, without the intense heat. Um, there's a little bit of heat, as I say, from near, uh, but not that much. And so it, it can potentially create a different challenge if we overdo it. Um, so, and whether you're overdoing it or not will depend on a bunch of different factors, but probably the primary one that you should be aware of is how close you are to these devices. So again, to go back a second, if we're talking about being in the sun, being by an open fire, don't worry about it. So long as you listen to your body's signals about what is too much heat um, in the case of an open fire. Uh, and you know, with the sun, there's a different variable, it's the UV, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, you'll be fine. You won't overdo it with the red specifically, but yeah, if you have a device that only does red and does really, really intense levels of red, then you don't get any of those normal signals that you would, that you're overdoing it. And so you have to be a little bit careful and you have to uh, get the distance away from you right. If you're dealing with a device that's like powerful, which will be the type that you might buy, as you said, like you've seen the ones that are hanging up on people's doors or whatever, Chrissy, yeah. that are you know, maybe several feet long, a, feet, a foot or two wide. Those ones can be pretty intense. Now, if we're talking about like some $30 device that you've got off Amazon, it's probably not very intense, probably don't have to worry about it too much, but they're also gonna have limited benefits, right? 
Um, they tend to be small, or like a very localized, and they can be helpful. Let's say you have a sore knee, you can get one of those pretty cheap ones, hold it right against your knee for a while, you know, every day, twice a day, you might start feeling better. Um, but if you want more systemic benefits of everything that we're talking about, um, which I think probably most people, that's more where they're interested in, then you need to get one of those bigger ones or you can go somewhere. In the same way that some people go to tanning, uh, you know, establishments to, to get UV light, uh, some of those establishments now are offering red light, like full body or fullish body red light. And some other establishments maybe that are not doing tanning, but they also offer it because they're, you know, holistic health places or whatever. So whether you have one in your own home or whether you're going somewhere, uh, my advice would be, be cautious initially. I think the reason why um, the effect was worse for me than my wife, and I really can't handle very much compared to most people I know, um, is because of the lead, is because of the you know proven and diagnosed heavy metal toxicity. So I said it speeds everything up. Um, it absolutely speeds up. Uh, we didn't really talk about this much other than the glymphatic system, but yeah, absolutely speeds up uh, some, another gene, an enzyme called NRF2. Uh, and this is a gene and enzyme um, that increases the excretion of toxins from cells. Um, one, of, one of many, but one of the primary ones. So all of these are also upregulated by um, you know, red light and near infrared light. So... From my perspective, in terms of like artificial things, if you think you're not toxic, let's just say, um, the best way to test that theory is probably taking high doses of niacin, nicotinic acid, and or doing high doses of red light and near infrared light. They, as far as I am aware, both in terms of research and practical experience, are the biggest uh, stimulators of the movement of toxins out of cells. And if they're going out of cells, they're going, you know, first of all, I mean, ideally, hopefully, and this is where far infrared light can be very beneficial and should not be ignored, because far infrared light will heat you enough to make you sweat. And if you sweat, ideally, the toxins go out of the cells and they will go out through the sweat. Hallelujah. That's a best case scenario. And that's why there is that protocol what I call the Scientology protocol, but you know, Dr. Smith referenced it recently on an episode as well, uh, where people take high doses of niacin to stimulate the toxins leaving the cells, even the mitochondria, and then they do the high levels of heat to sweat to get it out through that mechanism, ASAP. So that is, you know... I can't remember. There's a, I'll find the link and again, we can include it, Chrissy. But uh, there's a guy who has a book about this, a doctor who a lot of people have followed his protocol and swear by it. And it's basically about how to do that kind of reasonably safely, doing the high dose niacin with the high levels of saunering, I think usually hours a day. Ooh, and people, that's a lot. Yeah. And, but people feel transformed by it. You know, some people, really? if you, absolutely. If you can handle it, it can be a life transforming experience. And many people have done it successfully. Um, but it all depends on how much toxicity you have. And to some degree as well, it depends on as much as you're getting out for the sweat, some of it's still going to be, have to be dealt with by the liver. Some of it's still going to have to be dealt with by the kidneys. So it also depends on how much the blood is already overloaded with toxins, how much those, those organs are already, you know, functioning well or not, you know, maybe you have cholestasis like we've talked about, maybe you reduce kidney function, all the rest of it. So it's definitely a bit risky. Anyway, back to red light. Um, that to me, like, is, uh, you know, probably the primary concern about red light is um, that if you do not have a high level of cellular toxicity, it could still be problematic uh, because it is still at the level, the artificial levels that you're going to get on these intense devices, um, to some degree, it is a stressor to the body. It's not a, uh, you know, it's a signal. That's the word I used earlier. But with any signal, if you have a unnaturally high enough level of a sit signal, then it is also a stressor, like it bleeds into uh, being a stressor. So, you know, those of you who believe in hormesis, we had the episode uh, a while ago with... Uh, uh, Jay, where he kind of um, talks about how he doesn't really believe in the concept. I'm still a bit on the fence, but I, I think what he's saying makes sense. Um, 
And so what you're saying in a nutshell, again, is not that, so, not that nothing that stresses your body is okay, but it's more that the benefits are there despite the drawbacks, not because of the drawbacks. So meaning, like for instance, with sunlight, yeah, it stresses the body, but there's loads of benefits, a bunch of which we just talked about today, so overall it's worth it. Whereas the kind of mainstream perspective is more, no, no, the stress itself is beneficial. So that's, you know, that's the theory of hormesis in a nutshell. Um, so yeah, a high level of the red light will certainly have a hormetic effect because it is an unnaturally high level. It will both do all, uh, all of these positive things we talked about, but it is also a stressor on the body. And so we should be aware of that, even irrespective of any um, cellular toxicity. Whew. Right. So as a, going back to my earlier question, when I was asking about when you're looking for the product to purchase for red light therapy, you touched on if you're going to grab something from Amazon, maybe it's not as intense, things like that. Is there anything else in the description of the type of light bulbs or things that they're using that anybody would be looking out for to make sure that they're getting the right thing? Yeah, good question. So I would go for a combination of red and near infrared light. Um, usually the do certain frequencies because those are the frequencies that are most studied as being the most effective. Um, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but basically all the devices are all the same. And they'll tend to either have uh, three, four, or five of those frequencies. Some some companies will say it's only the, the uh, three primary ones are important, the other ones are not necessary. Some companies say no. Some will have like higher percentages of one than the other. I do not know enough to know that one is definitely better than the other. From the level of what I have seen, uh, no one knows. This is all just speculation. And even if we get some expert on who says that, oh, you know, this is <laughs> this one's better or that, that will be their perspective <laughs> um, and maybe right. not the final truth. Um, so, yeah, I might, I might change my mind about that. But so far, it just seems like, you know, different people have different perspectives on this. A lot of this based on the research. I suspect that as the research will increase, you know, there may be more frequencies that they find that they decide are beneficial after all. Um, they may change their mind to some degree. So I'm happy with anything that's basically within those near infrared spectrums and within those red spectrums. And But, you know, given all the research that's been done, yeah, you may as well go for the frequencies that are most commonly considered beneficial because why not? Um, but as I said, pretty much every company has those same ones anyway. All that varies is like the ratio and that some of them have a little bit of a couple of other ones. Um, so when I said about Amazon, you could get the really intense ones on Amazon. What I was really more talking about is the price. So I was saying like a $20 one, it will be just a little one. Um, that's not going to make much of a difference. It's probably not going to be too intense that you have to worry about any of these downsides, but it's also probably not going to be intense enough that it will have many of the benefits at all and certainly not systemically right if it has any benefit it'll, you know, it's going to be small and it will only apply very much locally to wherever you happen to be uh, placing it so i would say you know you want one reasonably big let's say you get one that's like half the size of your body um that's usually affordable ish to someone who's splashing out a little bit it's a few hundred dollars um so that one if you wanted to really put full benefit from your whole body you might do a certain period of time, you know, uh, bottom half of your body, top half of your body, one side, bottom half of your body, top half of your body, the other side. So it'd be like, you know, in four different segments. Um, if you really had a lot of money or, or if you're going to one of these uh, places that I talked about, then you can kind of get in this bed that covers all of your body 100% on the top and the bottom. Like you might imagine a tanning booth to be again, right? That like covers you completely on both sides uh, and so those devices exist in Excel it's just they're several thousands of dollars probably outside the <laughs> pr price range and also yeah. even just where the hell you're going to put it do you want this another huge thing in your house somewhere kind of thing so most people do go for the type that you talked about which is just like one panel Chrissy of one size or another that you know they can hang on the door um or that they can like shine over you know a bed or a massage table or a yoga mat or you know something like that if you prefer to lie down then it's not taking up a crazy amount of space and it doesn't cost a crazy amount of money so assuming you have one of those and and you know those ones that are like 500 dollars, 400 dollars plus ish they're probably all going to be a similar level of intensity the only thing that's going to vary then is just how big they are so in terms of how much terrain they're going to cover like i say you might have like a big panel that covers the top half of your body on one side 
or you might have like a full one that covers all of your body on both sides, right? But beyond a certain amount of money, it's not going to get any more intense or bright. It's just going to be bigger. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Um, and one other question before we move on, because um, we mentioned that the red light, as opposed to like the blue light, it's um, triggering the cortisol, but the red light, it's increasing the mitochondrial activation of our cells. Now, even though the red light is what we're supposed to have more of before we go to bed, how does that not activate us or keep us um, energized? Yeah, it's a great question. Because to a certain degree... Um the the uh, as remember i talked about kind of you're either in that high metabolism relaxed state or you're in that stress state you're not in both simultaneously you're like one or the other you might be you know between the two but the point is you're not both you're not a lot of both at the same time well it's the same thing with the light so high levels of the red light yeah it's true i haven't said you know it stimulates loads of gaba or it you know whatever i haven't like given a specific mechanism whereby it makes you relax uh, but it absolutely does. And so my, again, unless, you know, unless I'm going to learn something other, else, my understanding right now is that simply it does that, first of all, by opposing the effect of any blue light that may be still there, so counterbalancing and negating it. Um, so, And then second of all, as we've talked about, a relaxed state is a high energy state. Mm, this is okay. the thing that is always hard to get our heads around, um, but it is absolutely true that if we think about someone who's very tense and not able to relax, that is not a high energy individual. And the proof of that is when we die, what happens to our body? Does it like go all soggy like pudding and jelly and just collapse? No, it actually does the opposite, right? It becomes super hard and tense. And so this demonstrates that it actually requires energy to relax more than it requires energy to uh, contract. And so, yeah, by increasing the mitochondrial energy production, it reduces that. Uh, I believe that's the main mechanism, that it therefore then reduces the whole stress system because the body really only has the whole system as a, as I say, like a temporary emergency backup. Now, there's also the fact, of course, that the ratio of blue light is in nature is higher during the middle of the day when we're supposed to have more stress chemicals and then the ratio of red light is higher naturally only during um, the evening stroke night when we're supposed to have the lowest levels of stress chemicals. So there is also that circadian signaling that the red light does. Yes, it increases energy, but it also gives the circadian signaling like this is not daytime now. This is a time uh, to relax more. As I said, I haven't really seen that research though that like directly um, high levels of uh, near infrared light will like stimulate loads of GABA or uh, you know stimulate loads of uh, oxytocin or anything like that. It's not like relaxing you in that way, is my understanding. Um, it is more that it's like switching off or reducing the activity of the cortisol and the glutamate and all of these like stimulating neurochemicals. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. So now, UVA, UVB. Oh, well, just before that, that, you also okay. want to ask me earlier about the practicalities of red light. So, oh, yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. Let's discuss it. Yeah. So I know Let's we talked about in. it a little bit already um, in terms of me warning people not to overdo it. But yeah, just it's just practicality. So let's imagine you have access to one of those panels that we talked about, right? Um, and so I guess question, the most common questions are, uh, how long do I do it? And, you know, and the other one that should be thought about is how far away is it from you? 
So let me ask the how far away is it first. Um, the how far away, it depends partly on what you want to achieve. So this red light absolutely has the ability to penetrate into the body, even penetrate into and through the bones. But that effect is limited the further away it is. So what we generally say is if you are using it more for like anti-aging purposes, you want to do it especially for the skin, you want to look better, cellulite, uh, fat just beneath the surface maybe, all of that kind of stuff, um, then the correct distance to have it away from you, depending on who you listen to, but you know, roughly we're talking about like a foot and a half to two foot, something like that. So that's going to have more of an effect on the surface of the body uh, rather than penetrating deeply. Now, if it is that far away, which is reasonably far away, you can also do it for longer. Um, so it will have more of an impact on the skin than it, you know, because if you had it, say, twice as close, you would be able to do it half as long if that. So if you really, if your focus is the skin and the surface of your body, it's it's wise to do it further away. You're going to be able to do it longer. You're going to get be able to get more of the benefit to the skin. If, however, you want it to penetrate deeply, like into your you know your heart, your digestive organs, you know something like that, maybe your bones, as we talked about, uh, your brain, then it's going to have to be closer. And how close it is. Um, you know, I think six inches would be the kind of minimum that you want it away usually, up to a bit, which is so it's half a foot, 15 centimeters, up to maybe double that plus, you know, so maybe a foot away, maybe a foot, you know, maybe up to a foot and a quarter, something like that. Um, so you can kind of play with that. The closer it is, though, the less time that you want to do it for. So there's no hard and definite rules. I've, you know, there's different experts who teach about this. Some of them would say, you know, limit it to you know, five minutes, even if you have it as far away as two foot away. But I've seen some people talk about you can do it for an hour if it's that far away. So um, there's a very big range. And I think the reason is because it is so context dependent, right? What is too much depends a lot, which is why I spent quite a long time explaining at least some of those factors that I'm aware of. And I'm sure there's more as well that I either forgot right now or that I'm just not aware of. So there's a bunch of different stuff going on. So having said all that, because of the potential of it being too much in lots of different ways, I, and especially if you're not going somewhere, especially and having to pay by the minute or whatever, if you have it in your own home, which is really ideal, then I would start off very cautiously and slowly. Um, I would, even if you want it to affect, you know, your deep organs, not just the surface, I would have it a foot away or maybe more. And I would do it for maybe even just 30 seconds on each side or in each you know, part of your body if it's a smaller one. And then wait a day or two, see if you get any sudden feeling ill, feeling tired, feeling this, feeling that symptoms. Don't expect it because it's very unlikely to be honest with that level of exposure, but just check. Um, and then after a day or two, that's fine. Then do a bit more, right? Depending on how confident you feel, do 60, do 40 seconds, do 60 seconds, something like that. Uh, and then increase it. I wouldn't increase it by more than like half a minute or I'd say at the most a minute at a time. And just, you know, and make sure you're consistent with how far away it is from you because that is just as important as the time, right? So um, maybe if you're standing in front of one, then have like a marker where your feet are so you know that you're roughly the same each time so that you're able to measure it properly. Uh, obviously, if you're lying down, make sure it's a similar distance away from you each time. And uh, then see uh, how far you can take it. And if you're not looking to push it to the point where you <laughs> eventually do start to feel the negative effects, then you could probably happily limit it to the level of what I said. You know, some experts say like five minutes a day on each side, let's say, if you have to do one on each side, is probably plenty. Um, if you're doing it regularly, if you're doing it every day or several days a week, that's going to be enough according to, you know, most of the research to make a massive difference over the course of, you know, a few weeks to a few months. So yes, you probably can do it more depending on the context, but it's probably not actually necessary. Uh, that's probably plenty. Now, if you are using one of those devices I talked about, so they have a bunch of them. They have, as I say, like a baseball cap where it's pretty much touching you if you want to work on your brain. There's like a facial one if you want to give yourself like a facial rejuvenation where, again, it's almost touching your face. Um, 
with ones like that, again, because it is so much close, and I think there's a neck one as well, you know, people who worry about their neck looking too old, all that kind of stuff, although that would also help the thyroid. Um, for those kind of things, I would say I would start off really low, maybe in 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Make sure you do it on the minimum light intensity if there are settings for increasing or decreasing. Um, and, yeah, do it very gradually. Like, it... The intensity of the effect it has, if it's closer, is way more intense. So you have to take that into account. I was going to ask, is there, I mean, you mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the um, wearing the baseball cap, that you're not able to do it for certain periods of time, and that how you, you knew, you identified you weren't feeling good because you believe it was the, a detox effect. Are there any other signs or symptoms that somebody could recognize that they are potentially overdoing it? anything whatever your symptoms are so for me i said it's like an ill feeling but specifically it's like sinus is starting to get blocked but as i've talked before that's my genetics that's one of the first things that's likely to go wrong for me is sinuses now in this case it kind of made sense a bit because it's moving lymph in the in the head um but honestly you know sinuses could have been where it showed up for me if i did too long in my calves that's possible like because that's just where it goes wrong for me so the point is, whatever symptoms you have, if they start to come back again, rather than going, oh my God, what's this? Like, make that connection. Because it's, you know, depending on your background, it might be easy to go, oh, okay, this is what happens when I drink alcohol. This is what happens when I eat a certain food or this is what happens when I don't sleep or whatever. And so it's hard to think, it's because I was under light for a minute. Like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy connection to make because it... Again, with a far infrared, it's easy to know how intense it is because you feel hot and you start sweating. So you realize, oh, this is an intense thing. Even if you might think it's no big deal to get hot and sweat, at least your body registers. It's kind of obvious that it is, in, on one level, an intense process. With the red light, it can feel like it is nothing, and yet it can still have this powerful effect. And so just remember and make that connection in your head that whatever symptom it is that you have, you know, this could be why it's back again, because you have reduced the, um, you know, efficiency of energy production in your body, which is good. Like, you know, improving the, improving the effectiveness of your immune system, for instance, could make you feel worse as well, because suddenly your immune system starts fighting some chronic infection. I mean, it's possible that was going on for me, for my sinuses. The reason I've ruled that out is because I've had the contents of my sinuses tested and there's no infectious agents there. So I'm like, okay, so it's it's toxins, right? But most people have not had that tested, so then they don't know. So, you you know, you don't know. If you start feeling worse in your gut, or if you start feeling worse in your sinuses, you start feeling worse in your skin, uh, what start feeling worse in your bladder, whatever, could be something infectious and it could be stimulating the immune system that's doing it. Um, it's hard to know for sure about testing. But either way, uh, it's probably wiser to just take it more slowly. Good advice. So now UVA and UVB. So this one, it's, um, I mean, we all know about it, about going out in the sun, you know, going out uh, at the beach, getting a nice tan, doing things like that. But let's, um, you know, dive into a little bit more about what, what it is, what they do, benefits, and the not so benefits. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one I'm the least about, can probably compared to the others. Uh, so it's probably a good thing as we've almost at time already. Um, and it's the one that I think the expert I want to invite on will be able to eludicate the most. Um, because, you know, the so there is this idea that UV light is dangerous, that it causes the C word, that it is prematurely aging. Uh, there's certainly you know, evidence for that. That's not a spurious position. There's, you know, photos of before and after and one side of the body having UFV more than the other and looking a lot more aged and all the rest of it. Um, that it um, that it burns you, right? That's the, thi the thing that burns you. And all those things are true. <laughs> um, potentially, they could be true. So UVA and UVB, simply, again, from a practical point of view, most people know UVA is a type that tans you, and then UVB is a type that stimulates vitamin D3. And so both have that, you know, benefit, I guess, if you want to see tanning as a benefit, I think most people do, even if they don't do it because they 
you know, they don't want to age their skin or whatever. I think most people these days would think of it as a benefit. Um, now, the generally the perspective from the mainstream medical pers- uh, establishment is UV is just a bad, right? Other than the UVB, but the UVB out of the UVA and B is the type that burns you more. Um, so if you do go to a tanning place, um, usually it'll be like 100% UVA or maybe it'll be 80% UVA, but it's a majority of UVA. Um, there are, you know, however, certain things that indicate it might not be as simple as that. So one of them is, for instance, with skin issues, especially with psoriasis, that people um, have those get better and resolve, certainly when they get sunlight, again, as long as it's not excessive, but actually even if they get artificial fake tanning UVA light, it works just as well uh, in many cases. And it's interesting that that's the case because as we just said, UVA light doesn't really stimulate vitamin D3, so that can't be the reason why it's effective. Um, And so, you know, another interesting thing, and Dr. Smith, who's been on here before, has pointed this out, that most, you know, there's abundance, you probably all heard about the research about how beneficial it is to be in the sun, um, even though there are potentially drawbacks, but some degree of sun exposure, right? Everyone kind of seems to agree on this. But most of the research on the benefits of being in the sun is actually done using UVA lights, not sunlight, because, or UVA and B lights, not sunlight, because scientists hate uh, working with variables that they cannot control. And of course, you know, even in the, uh, the warmest climate, you can never be 100% sure there's not going to be a cloud or there's not going to be something, right? And they want to do it all in a lab where it's all, you know, contained and isolated and there's no variables and blah, 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 like scientists like to do. So actually most of the research on humans and on animals and all the rest of it, that there are benefits to sunlight come from UVA and UVB lights. So this does indicate, so these couple of little things do indicate to me that the simple idea that um, sunlight is bad or even the idea that UV light is bad is overly simplistic. That it's probably just like with blue light, just like with far infrared light, just like with near infrared light and red light, a case of too much is not good, but too little is also not good, right? It's very easy once you learn about all the benefits of red light and all the problems of blue light to start being like, well, red red is good, blue is bad. But that's why I actually started the episode talking about the benefits of blue light and kind of ended it with the drawbacks of red light because it's obviously not as simple as that. And I, you know, my understanding is the same with uh, UV. So we've talked about how blue light kind of regulates that uh, circadian uh, system. Well, I, I'll just touch upon this. Although, as I said, I would like a, a more of an expert to come on and, you know, we can grill them more thoroughly. So I think the emerging understanding is that it isn't only blue light that sets that circadian rhythm. That actually the reason why going outside and getting real light is by far preferable if you possibly can as opposed to the blue light that I just said, which is reasonably effective for SAD, uh, enough that it's, you know, measurable. Uh, but that going outside and getting actual UV light is uh, you know, very important for that whole circadian system itself. Part of that that I will just touch upon is um, obviously that UVA light specifically, what did I say? I said it was tanning, right? So what does that mean? Irrespective of how you look, what that means is it's producing melanin. And melanin is a very interesting substance, way beyond its how it makes you look. And it seems to be something that is like a, um, a biophoton storage container and something, there are theories, and again, I'd like to get someone on to explain this theory properly because I don't understand it enough, that the kind of melanin system is actually a more important element of energy in the body than the whole Krebs cycle ATP system. Now I'm laughing, I don't know if that's true, I suspect like always with these theories, maybe its importance has been overblown by the people who discovered it. And yet still, who knows, maybe it ends up being 30%, maybe it ends up being even 10%, you know, still makes a significant difference. And maybe it's not a matter of 
one is this percent, one is that percent, but maybe it's a matter of they're both super important in their own different way. And I suspect that's actually probably what's going to be the case, that ATP is super important in its own way, but then melanin uh, and its biophoton conducting capacity is very um, important in its own way when it comes to energy. And they're just like different dimensions that are both important that we both need to look at. Um, in terms of the damaging effects of UV, uh, I do think it's interesting that when you pull up a map of the incidence of skin melanoma by like throughout the world, basically the closer you come to the, the equator, the less you have incidence of skin C and the further away you get from the equator. So the more northerly you get, especially and to some degree southerly you get, um, the colder and darker and less UV light there is, the more incidence there is of skin C. And so there's different theories for that. Maybe the people who are in the climate that has less sunlight, they're using more blue light throughout the day and night. Maybe that could be why they're indoors more because it's colder, all of that kind of stuff. That could be why. Um, but it certainly casts a little bit of doubt to me on this idea that UV light is just damaging um when you know in fact it's the absent it it appears to correlate at least that is the word there's a correlation between the less uv light you get and the less health you have you could say is it just because the vitamin d i doubt it but i guess that's one simple explanation um so yeah i guess the uv section of this video is more of a teaser as to <laughs> we'll, we'll do a future episode where we get into this in more detail either if i can't find the expert then maybe i have to become one or we'll get another expert to <laughs> yeah. talk about it um ideally we'll get someone else who's already an expert because uh, it's simpler than <laughs> me having to learn everything but uh yeah uv i guess what i would start with is um it's not clear to me that UV light, UVB light is bad. And in fact, I have a UVB lamp that I use several times a week instead of having a uh, vitamin D3 supplement. Um, I am not against vitamin D3 supplements. I was saying in the comments on YouTube, you know, just recently someone was saying it's poison. I said, well, look, I just had a friend who was having chronic lung infections that were life threatening and he was tested by a normal medical doctor and they found that he, um, he had uh, very low levels of vitamin D3. They gave him like a huge dose in capsules and he immediately started to feel better and stopped having the infections. Like, I believe that, like, that happens. Um, I think that if you are very, very low, you can potentially feel a lot better when you have it. I know different people would have different theories as to why that is that are not always 100% positive. Um, but I do also think that it is better... Um, because most people have this issue where they have this buildup of cholesterol and it's not converting to the other things it should be, like, you know, for instance, pregnenolone and DHEA and all the rest of it, as we've talked about many times. But one of the other things cholesterol is supposed to convert to is vitamin D3. So, yes, it is better to me if you have your own cholesterol convert to it. So I do understand and agree with that perspective. Do you think that the, that the reason that cholesterol isn't converting is down to the um, metabolism, the thyroid function, or is it something else? Um, well, this concept, was we're talking about just a lack of UB, just, UVB light. Right, 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 right. Because people are not in the sun all day. That, no, like exactly. The, like they used to be, yeah. Uh, it could be another factor, but um, I think the UVB light does force that conversion to some degree. But yes, there could be things that would limit it definitely as well. Some people definitely have problems making in as much vitamin D. But still, I think if you get a high enough level of vitamin D, uh, vi sorry, UVB light, you'll make enough vitamin D3 in most cases. That's my understanding. Um, and so, and yeah, with the vitamin A, uh, sorry, UVA, um, you know, Dr. Smith has this theory about how it helps to, well, the theory I think is not questioned that... Um, that the UVA does increase the conversion of um, retinol to retinoic acid. Um, here's this theory, of course, that's then you sweat it out and that's a good thing. It's like detoxing it. I guess that's maybe not everyone's going to agree with that idea that, you know, the less you have, the better, but it does do that process. Um, it's, you know, it's an oxidizer. It oxidizes many things. And in some cases, like in the case of vitamin D3 and potentially in the case of uh, the retinoic acid, it's a good thing to oxidize it. Um, but of course, you can oxidize too much. That's you know the idea of rust, rusting and uh, free radicals and advanced aging and all the rest of it. 
Um, there's also the theory, so Dr. Smith has a theory that if you are, if your vitamin A levels are low enough, then you no longer burn from UV light exposure. I'm pretty sure that's not been lab tested yet, but he may be right. Uh, another theory that's also not been lab tested, but I've seen more commonly is that, um, that it's really seed oils that are the problem. The fact that, you know, everyone has some degree of subcutaneous fat and that if you have, um, omega-6 fats, predominantly subcutaneously, they are much more easily oxidized and they are much more damaged by oxidization than if it were more saturated fats. Um, so it's definitely also possible that as you in reduce your amount as of omega-6, especially in your, in your tissues, especially beneath your skin, that the UV light would be less burning. And so, yes, the UV is an oxidizer. Yes, that can damage. Yes, that can prematurely age you. But I guess what's still on the fence to me is is that because it is innately damaging or is it because we are toxic and it is interacting with our toxins to damage us good question very good question so then beyond what we've just discussed here i think you've kind of taken a uva and uvb uh, you know you've given us a good uh, perspective on on all sides is there Anything else that you want to add about light therapy? Yeah, you know, if all of this sounds simple, I guess I'll just do a very quick summary. Um, try and go outside and get sunlight within an hour of waking up. If you can't and you really feel bothered by the lack of sunlight, especially during the winter, consider one of those blue light devices. Try it. They're pretty cheap. Um, I would restrict blue light, especially an hour or two before you go to sleep, as you said, Chrissy, and preferably really from sunset onwards. And increased red light is another way of doing it. Like one thing I did before I updated and changed all my light bulbs is just the rooms that I was in more predominantly, I just put like a red light. I think the bulb is like five pounds and then the, the stand to put it in was like 30 or something like that. and just had a, a fairly bright red light in the room just to balance out all the blue light that was coming from all the rest of it. And just that in itself, actually, I found pretty uh, effective. So that's a practical thing that's pretty cheap. If the idea of replacing all of your blue lights um, for these ex fancy expensive ones is, you know, not doable, um, and you also don't fancy wearing the glasses, that is like a third compromise way is just increase the red light at night by adding a red light. That's, you know, another way of doing it. Um, if you want to do the red light therapy, it's one of the most powerful things you can do. Uh, I hope I didn't put you off it. I just wanted you to like respect the, how powerful it is and that you got to, you know, treat it with respect just because as I said, there's not the obvious, like the UV light you burn with the infrared light, you sweat profusely. There's not like an obvious thing telling you you've overdone it with the, uh, with the red light, but, um, yeah, it's there. And uh, lastly, with the UV light, um, look out for the future episode. I guess we're going into it more detail, but just be open about it, I guess. Like you can always do your own research into it about UV light and melanin and is UV light actually, UV light innately an issue. Also look into the rate of skin C and uh, sunscreen use and see if that's your correlation. That was a, yeah, I was going to ask, that was the point because I was watching something um, or I'm, yeah, sc scrolling up and uh, the guy handed a doctor just a, an off the shelf, uh, you know, sun, sunscreen. And he just looked at the ingredients and he's like, nope, 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 nope. And it's just like, this is, this is garbage. It's just full of toxins. It's not good for you at all. So you also, it goes to wonder like what, what are we potentially also doing to ourselves by introducing even more of this as we're trying to protect ourselves? There has to be a better way or, or needed more education here. I would never use on screen. I haven't used it in over 10 years. If you have to go from not getting any sun exposure to suddenly being out in the bright sun all day, then you might have to because the alternative would be to get burned. But I would try and avoid that situation in the first place. How would you avoid that situation? Um, well, you can either hardly go out in the sun, like you said you do, Chrissy, so that's one way. Um, or the other way is to, you know, let's, uh, you know, when it's spring, make sure you start getting out there and getting 
a bit more exposure on a regular basis and kind of build it up very slowly. That's how I did it because I was super sensitive to sunlight because of all the impact it had and the toxins I still had. So I'd be like, one day I'd be out there, literally one minute on one side, one minute on the other, done, in the house for the rest of the day. And the next day, two minutes, you know, like, and then the next, wasn't one day after the other because this is England, right? But again, <laughs> the next day the sun was out. I was going to say, what year was that? That must have been an amazing year. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep increasing. And then, you know, once I could get to like half an hour on each side, what I found is in, you know, midday intense sun, then pretty much, you know, I didn't have to worry about it anymore. Like that's it. I wasn't going to get burned anymore. Um, so that's my experience of it. I mean, I'm not an extremely pale, fair person, I guess. You know, I'm not an albino or close to it. So obviously, again, if you are that, it's going to be a bit different for you and you got to be a bit more careful but yeah I w- i'd rather wear a, what's it called a niqab or whatever than sunscreen personally i would rather completely shelter myself from the sun than to wear sunscreen um yeah sunscreen is toxic as hell and i know there's some out there they're not too bad and some of them use like zinc oxide as the active ingredient in the air zinc's not too bad and all the rest of it but as you said when you actually look at that ingredient list you know, it'd have to be a pretty extreme situation for me to use it. And as I said, it hasn't happened in 10 years. I remember when I, you know, I flew over to California and it was like winter and or it was like October, November. So I hadn't been sunny in England for quite a while, but it was real, really sunny there. It was San Diego. And I like went out surfing all day. This is, it must have been about 10 years ago. And um, so I basically went from almost no light sunlight, right, to all day sunlight. And I refused to wear sunscreen and I did get bit burnt <laughs> that's like the last time um so i you know i realize it does happen and uh maybe that's not ideal probably getting burnt is worse for you and more toxic than sunscreen using sunscreen once but i'm just saying i would avoid it <laughs> I, I, if you're not going to get burned personally Great. And I really, really, really appreciate this look at light therapy because now I feel more empowered, more educated, and also intrigued on, you know, because I actually do have a a beauty red light mask and I'm like, I'm going to go use that tonight. (laughs) I'd be like, oh gosh, you have this thing and it's got all these benefits. So yes, let me start using it. So thank you for the education. You don't have to use it for long, even 10, 15 seconds a day. I mean, literally the research will show because it's so close to your face, right? 10, 15 seconds a day. Over the course of a month, you might actually see noticeable, like you can see in the mirror results. It really is quite impressive how powerful it is. Thank you, Ellen. This has been very educational for me. I'm really very appreciative of it. And to our lovely listeners, as always, again, thank you for joining us here. So please make sure you like, subscribe, hit that bell icon for all the notifications and make sure you leave us your comments. Tell us how we did. Tell us if there's uh, something that you're interested in or if you've got more information on light therapy or if you have somebody in mind that you know as an expert in this that we might be able to reach out to and have on as a guest. We love your feedback and we love your input. As always, take care and we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.